tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. I can always count on you to be here, can't I? Rain, sleet, or snow. Well, rain anyway. Right this way to Drew Blood's house of horror, blood, and mayhem, and craving. Chester, I ain't in the goddamn mood today. I'll turn you into a fucking suitcase, you scaly prick. Come on. I'm sorry about that. Uh, have yourself a seat, Rick. Let me just unwrap the stuff here before we get started. Hmm. They say this special gum here is supposed to help you quit smoking. I tell you, it, it works great. I haven't even had a thought of one all day. No cravings at all. Who needs them, right? <laughs> Not me. Not even on my mind. <laughs> hmm. Damn it. Ain't there anything stronger around here? Hmm. Hmm. So, chew them if you got them, and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because your old good buddy Drew Blood has a tale to tell. <laughs> hmm. This is Season 1, Episode 7 of Drew Blood. You're listening to the Standard Edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. And we are accepting submissions, friends. To be considered as a featured author in an upcoming episode, send your stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If you're selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, here goes. Tonight we have the tale from author Christopher Zaleski. A tale of tragic loss and redemptive madness. And some other stuff I probably shouldn't blow for you before we get to it. This is no Hollywood trailer, you understand. Hey, how many pieces of this gum am I allowed to chew? One per out. God damn it! Uh, one more can't hurt. In any case, let's get on with it. Without further delay, I give you... Strange Playthings. Pete West, a man in his fifties, hair graying, zero pep in his step, a look of sorrow in his face, pushed a shopping cart in front of him, slow and steady, down the canned vegetable aisle. The search he was on this mid-afternoon was for just a few things, as today wasn't a normal shopping day. So, as he puttered along down the aisles, his mind was able to drift off to other times, when things used to be different, and how things could have been. Normally, Peter would be happy as he walked around the store, smiling and greeting those he came in contact with. Most of the town people knew him and enjoyed seeing the bright and cheerful joy. Today, however, today everyone knew. Today, unfortunately, was the tenth anniversary of his wife's death. Not a day to celebrate, but a day to mourn, and the town mourned with him. Memories poured in, flooding his mind. He could remember where he was the day he got the call, when the phone had vibrated in his pants pocket. It couldn't have been a worse time to answer. Pete was with a client who had a tree growing through his home. They were standing in front of said tree, going over the homeowner's insurance. So, of course, the call went to voicemail. But the dreaded thing kept vibrating, first annoying him, but then becoming worrisome. 
so much so he had to excuse himself to answer it. Officer Nelson Quick was in his 20s, but over the phone just now sounded matured well beyond his years. Peter. The man's voice was scratchy and dry, like he had just finished crying. It's Nelson. Yes, Nelson. What? Peter had started saying, but Nelson cut him off. Peter, you need to come down to the station right now, Nelson said. Nelson, I can't. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's Emma. Come right now. Nelson seemed to be getting upset. Emma? What happened? I'm not saying over the phone. Just get down here now. Okay, Nelson, calm down. I'll be right over. I'm just down the street. So he excused himself from his client, telling him an important matter involving his wife had come up and he had to go. Without waiting for a response, he turned and ran to his car. He never looked back. Arriving at the station, seeing Nelson, and then being led to the morgue, these memories were all cloudy to him now. Like a nightmare, the brain buries far away into a deep, dark place inside the mind. He could barely remember identifying Emma. Her body was covered head to toe and they had only pulled down the sheet far enough so he could just see her face. The rest of her was too mangled, they had told him. That much he remembered clearly. Though part of him wanted to see what his wife looked like under the sheet, he felt the urge to pull it, just to grab it and yank it down to see her crushed body, her limbs twisted and broken, but he hadn't done it. What would they have thought of him, and how could he live with those visions in his mind? So, with longing eyes, he only stared at her bloody face, her closed eyes and the way that beautiful long blonde hair had been all tangled and dirty. The pain from that day was here now, weakening his knees, urging him to fall as he fell into Nelson's arms that day. Everything had gone dark then. No sound had entered his ears, no light through his eyes, only the pain like the pain he felt now. With a deep breath and great will, he forced the horrid images away. Blinking in the light of the store, images of canned vegetables filled his eyes. It was important to think of only what he needed for tonight and nothing else. The meal he was going to cook, now that he had thought about it, had been the first meal Emma had cooked for him so many years ago when they had first started dating. Funny how the mind works, isn't it? he thought, pulling down a can of corn from the shelf. It had been Jill, though, who had suggested he make his meal tonight. She thought it would be a nice way to remember his wife and celebrate the love and life she'd lived. It was important to keep in mind that the love she had once given still lived within him while he gave his own upon the world. Ah, Jill, he thought to himself. Jill was his first female encounter after Emma had passed away. She was tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a slim figure. A perfect fit for his lonely life. He wouldn't call her a first girlfriend or love, but a companion may fit better. Sure, she lived with him and was always there for him when he was feeling down. Always gave him a smile to brighten up his day. There were times of pleasure, times of laughter, and never a time when they had been mad at each other. The perfect relationship but she had not been the only one. There was Jennifer, who had brown hair and brown eyes, slim figure also, but much larger up top than Jill. She had been quiet so far, but she was new to the home, still learning the ropes. Eventually, she would start getting all the pleasantries the other ladies got. Peter still hadn't broken her in. He was still courting her in a way. It was important that she knew him well, and loved him the way he would do for her one day soon. And there was Jamie, who had come to him about a year before Jennifer. She was much shorter, only five feet three inches to be exact, but she was energetic, bright-eyed, and willing to please. There was no doubt she had been very special to him on those nights he was feeling rambunctious. At last, but not least, was Josie. She was more of a petite type with blonde hair and emerald green eyes, but very strong. The alpha female, Peter always felt she had the house in order and kept the other girls in line. 
Thinking about his girls improved his mood, and he whistled as he finished his shopping, hummed as he reached the checkout line, smiled ear to ear as he walked out of the store. His thoughts were with the girls, anticipating what the night would bring. Unfortunately, the thoughts distracted him from noticing the three men following close behind as he traveled back home. Peter lived in a rent-style home on just over an acre of land. After Emma's death, there was a short lawsuit which settled out of court, considering the truck company's driver had been intoxicated. The settlement was quite large, and Peter had been tempted to buy a larger, more luxurious home. But in the end, this was where his heart was. Emma would have wanted him to stay here. The house sat far off the street. His closest neighbor was a few hundred yards away. Alone and quiet was how he liked it. Just him and his girls in peace was what he craved every day. No kids screaming outside. No loud, busy streets with their honking cars. Just silence. Peter stepped through the doorway with his two bags of groceries. Jamie was sitting at the dining room table with a beautiful yellow spring dress draped on her body. Her reading glasses lined on the tip of her nose and a magazine opened in front of her. This had once been Emma's favorite thing to do on a lazy Sunday. Josie was on the couch with the television on, wearing just a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, once Emma's favorite bum around the house outfit. He could already see Josie was going to do just that, bum around the house for the rest of the day. But why not? It was Sunday after all. Jill, I'm home, Peter said in a husky voice, not yelling, but loud enough for the house to hear. Peter went into the kitchen and placed the bags on the table. He embraced Jill, who had been standing by the stove, pan in hand. He wrapped his arms around her robed body, feeling underneath with his hands, realizing she was still naked, another trait of Emma's. She'd always loved walking around the house with only her robe on, nothing else. Taking it slow today, are we, Jill? Peter asked, growing excited as he cupped her breasts in his hands. Peter lifted her up and carried her down the hall to the bedroom, and then slammed the door closed behind him. The other girls smiled and stared. After some time had passed, Peter left the room, went back into the kitchen to get dinner ready. A joyful song whistled between his lips as he worked. Glancing back into the living room, he saw Jennifer sitting on the couch opposite of Josie. Strange, he didn't quite remember seeing her there earlier. He did, however, like the little plaid skirt and the white button-down shirt she was dressed in. This was one of Emma's playful outfits, something she wore when she wanted to get a little naughty in the bedroom. It was her go-to skirt, but the shirt never stayed on for long. With dinner simmering and wine poured, Peter went back into the room to get Jill. He stopped short at the door. She was dressed in a beautiful gown, one that had been Emma's so many years ago. One she had worn on special occasions, like weddings or baptisms. Jill? How? Peter stammered, trying to remember if he had gotten her dressed after their little love session. Things like this have been happening lately. Incidents of lost time. Minutes. Hours. Who knew how long sometimes. But the end result was the dolls doing something or being somewhere that he couldn't recall or even explain. Jill stared back at Peter, eyes wide with excitement, a beautiful smile across her face. She looked full of life. Jill, you never cease to amaze me. Peter took her hands and twirled around with her like a couple of dancers. We're all going to have a great time tonight. Peter danced Jill out into the kitchen, then sat her down at the table. You sit and rest while I... The sound of an approaching vehicle gave him pause. Who in the world could that be? He wondered, looking out the kitchen window at the blue sedan coming up the driveway. The evening sun was setting behind the trees in the distance. Peter hurried out the door and went outside to greet his visitors. Surely they had the wrong house, and he would just get them on their way. Three grinning men got out of the car. The driver was first to speak. Well, hello there, he said, walking toward Peter with his hand extended. 
Peter stayed on the porch. He felt uneasy, a sense that something was wrong. Hello, he responded, but didn't raise his hand. Are you guys lost? Are you Peter West? The driver asked. Depends who's asking, Peter said, getting defensive. Let's stop the games, West, the driver said. I know you are. And before Peter knew it, one of the passengers was right next to him with a gun drawn. Let's go inside. Back inside, Peter shifted his gaze nervously between his girls. Jamie was sitting upright, her glasses now placed on top of the magazine. Bright crystal blue eyes stared lifelessly at the four men. Jill stood in the kitchen, staring at the three strangers who were looking around in wonder. Peter looked away from Jill to the couch where Jennifer was sitting, hands folded on her lap. Next to her, Josie was sitting with her legs curled up to her chest, her arms slightly wrapped around them. The smooth, angelic face that always smiled now looked dark, almost angry. J Josie? Peter stuttered nervously, fear raising in his heart. He almost forgot for a second that he wasn't alone. Well, holy shit. What in the world you got going on in here? The driver asked, waving his own gun around the living room. Playing house with your dolls or something? Peter didn't answer, just looked around nervously. These dolls or girls or whatever you wanted to call them. Sometimes when he was losing time, it almost seemed like they moved on their own. <laughs> Looks like we got a perverted freak here, fellas, one of the men said. Ain't that right, Nicky? He snorted a short laugh. <laughs> the driver, or Nicky, laughed along. <laughs> you can say that again, Dale. Peter's mind was spinning, his heart thudding with fear and excitement. One of the men was now standing by Jamie. He was pulling down the top of her dress, trying to sneak a peek at her breasts. She doesn't like that, Peter snapped. The man snatched his hand away and stepped back. The other men laughed while sweat beaded on his forehead. He wiped a shaking hand across it. Tommy, quit being such a pussy, Nicky said. Yeah, <laughs> stop being one and go grab one, Dale laughed. He walked over to Jill standing by the kitchen. Peter watched as he started to mess around with Jill's gown. First he unzipped it and it fell down around her feet. Then he removed the bra and started fondling her breasts. As he did this, he looked over to Peter, who was now getting angry. Stop that, Peter yelled. They actually feel pretty real, Dale said. Please, Peter pleaded as he watched the man lower his hand to Jill's panties. I I'm begging you to stop. Dale grinned at him and then slowly pulled the panties down, exposing her completely. He bent, looking down between her legs and then back at the others. Mm, looks real, too, he said. <laughs> he and Nicky started laughing. <laughs> Tommy only looked around nervously. Dale put his hand between the doll's legs, rubbing her with his fingers. <laughs> it kind of feels real, too, I guess. Stop it, Peter burst out. Whatever you're here for, just take it and leave us alone. Peter tried to move towards Dale, but Nicky had him by the arm. And where do you think you're going? Peter yanked his arm free, then turned and kneed Nicky between the legs. <laughs> he then charged at Dale, who didn't seem to notice what was going on at first, but spun around at the last moment. Peter grabbed him by the shoulder with his left hand and cocked his right arm back. But Dale, completely calm, brought his gun up in a smooth swing, catching Peter across the left side of his face. Peter fell to the side, cracking his head against the dining room table. He crashed to the floor, unconscious. What the fuck, Dale? Tommy said. He raced over to Peter and knelt next to him. There was blood pouring from his forehead. It doesn't matter, Dale said. We're probably going to kill him anyway. He looked down at Peter's limp body. Is she dead? Shit, I don't know how to do this. Tommy looked afraid to touch him at first, but reluctantly placed a finger on Peter's wrist. <laughs> I think so, man, he said, his voice breaking. Shit, I think we're fucked. He rubbed a hand repeatedly through his hair. Nicky moaned, getting to his feet. <sighs> Good for him. Bastard need my nuts. 
You didn't say we were killing anyone, Tommy snapped. Just shut up the two of you, Dale said. Let me think a second. He began pacing the floor in front of Jill. Two steps, turn, two steps, turn, like a caged animal. Uh, let's just get what we came for. Tommy, you come with me to help open the safe. Nikki, you clean up any evidence that we were here. And the body? Nikki asked. Leave it for now, Dale said, and left the room. Tommy trailed behind them like a lost puppy, glancing over his shoulder at Nikki before going out of sight. Nikki walked over to the couch. He saw Jennifer staring up at him, her bright, lifelike eyes gleaming hatefully at him. All Nikki could do was mush the doll's face aside, forcing it to fall off the couch. She bounced and landed on her side. Her skirt pulled up, exposing her ass. She had no underwear on. Nikki licked his lips in consideration, but the possibly dead man lay nearby. His forehead still poured blood, but Nikki wondered if it might not be as bad as it appeared. He gave him a firm kick to the side to check if he was faking, and just then he noticed a beautiful gold watch on the man's wrist. He squatted next to him and pulled it off. Inspecting it, he noticed the doll's ass again from the corner of his eye. Her most intimate of areas exposed. It does look real, doesn't it? <laughs> he said aloud. Nikki went to the doll and maneuvered it so it was on all fours. Arms bent so to rest it on its elbows, legs bent and spread so that she was on her knees. Its hair hung down over its head. The skirt hiked up around its waist. Nikki fondled its curve, studying how real it was. It was soft and smooth. His mind was spinning now. If this was going to happen, it had to happen now. There was no waiting until later. But maybe there would be a later too, he thought, because this bitch was coming home with him. Nikki pushed a finger inside the doll, noting how dry it was. Well, damn, honey. No way I'm going to be able to. Oh. Suddenly his head was yanked back by the hair. Oh, what the? Nikki winced, reaching back for whoever was doing it. The pulling continued until the hair was practically being ripped from his scalp. When he finally opened his eyes looking through tears of pain, he couldn't believe what he saw standing in front of him. It just couldn't be real. <laughs> An insane little laugh escaped him. No! He was cut off by a silicone hand and arm entering his mouth and pushing down his throat. Nikki gasped as blood poured out of his mouth, his body convulsing. Nikki, what the hell you doing out there? A voice yelled from the other room. The arm slid free of Nikki's mouth, letting his body thump to the floor, still twitching, blood oozing from his mouth. Damn it, Nikki, I said to. Dell's voice stopped at the sight of Nikki on the floor, blood pooling around his head. What in the hell? Dell ran to Nikki's side. Unsure what to make of it all, only when he looked up did he see the naked doll sitting on the couch, the one he had taken the dress off of. But how did she get on the couch? Had Nikki put her there? And why the hell did she have Nikki's gun in her hand? And why was she pointing it at him? Before Dale could even consider it, the gun fired several times, each bullet entering his chest. Dale staggered, grunting after each shot. His eyes focused on the naked doll as he fell. His last breath released when his head crashed against the floor. Tommy ran into the room so fast he nearly slid across the floor. He gaped at the murderous scene. One doll stood, its arm dripping with blood. Another doll was on all fours, skirt down around its waist, its ass up in the air. A third doll sat on the couch, clutching a gun. And there was Nicky, blood pulling around his head, and Dell, his chest splashed in blood. Tommy's drill dropped from his hand and onto the floor, his eyes unbelieving of what they saw. They moved quickly around the room between the death and the dolls. The death. The dolls. There were three dolls in this room. Hadn't there been another? At the dining room table wearing the sundress, he tried peeking down her dress. Where was she now? She was gone. 
A few more steps into the room, he released a shaky breath and ran both his hands through his hair. The room eerily quiet. So quiet he could hear his own heartbeat speeding up. And then a hand reached over his shoulder and touched his chest. Fear like no other coursed its way through him. Urine ran down his legs and onto the blood-soaked floor. The hand massaged his chest mechanically. It was smooth but almost robotic, jerking down and up, side to side. Tommy closed his eyes and prayed this had all been just a dream. A dream that now had reached its peak of terror. And any second now, he would wake up at home in his own bed. There was no luck in that prayer. God wasn't listening to thieves and murderers. Not today. The sound of a drill made Tommy's eyes shoot open. He remembered that he had dropped it earlier, but who had it now? The answer came in a flash as he felt the tip of the drill bit touch the back of his head and the agonizing pain when it passed through his skull and into his brain. But it didn't stop there. The drill bit was long and it had some distance to go. All Tommy could do was twitch, his eyes crossing to watch the drill bit emerge from between them. A haunting moan bellowed out through the room as his body dropped to the floor. The drill left lodged in the back of his head. The operator answered. There was only static on the other end of the line. Hello? Anyone there? Are you hurt? Still more static, but then a sliding noise. Hello? Can you talk? More sliding in response, but then something chilling came through the line. A moan so ghostly, so sad, so loud the operator had to pull the headphones off. The first officer arrived at the house shortly. He knew Peter West very well. He hurried out of the car, noticing the door was left wide open. It may be a small town, but the people who lived here didn't usually leave their front doors open. Peter, he called out. Nothing but spine chill in silence. Inside, the house was dark, too dark to want to enter. The sound of another patrol car on the gravel driveway made him jump. Turning, he watched the car, but from inside the house came a sad moan, freezing the officer where he stood. What's up, Nelson? The other officer said, exiting his vehicle, but Nelson only swallowed hard. The other officer, noticing Nelson's widened face, asked again. Nelson? Nelson only turned to look at the house, his hand resting on his revolver. Nelson, what's going on? Shh. Nelson waved at him to keep it down. The two officers stood listening, but they heard nothing. The second officer moved to go inside, but Nelson grabbed his arm. Wait, Jimmy. Maybe we should get some more backup. There was fear written all over his face. And then another moan came from the house. Louder this time. Almost like it was calling to them. Getting impatient. Concerned that there was someone hurt inside, Jimmy ignored Nelson and went for the door. Nelson tried to grab his arm again, but missed. Reluctantly, he went in after him. Inside the home, the two officers had the shock of their lives. Jesus. On the couch sat, from left to right, one doll wearing a sundress, blood splattered all over her face. Another doll, dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, blood covering most of her left arm. The next doll was naked, a gun clutched in her hand. The last doll wore a white blood-stained shirt and a plaid miniskirt. Across them lay Peter West, eyes closed, dry blood caked on his forehead. At their feet lay the bodies, one drool in blood, another with bullet wounds to the chest, and a third with a cordless drill stuck in the back of his head. What the hell happened here? Jimmy asked afraid to move any further into the house. Peter? Peter moaned, struggling to open his eyes. Suddenly, the dolls all turned their heads to look down at him. Jesus! At this, the officers froze. Nelson? 
I don't see anything, do you? Jimmy said nervously, unable to take his eyes off the dolls. Jimmy, I wasn't even here. Nelson turned and ran for the door. Jimmy followed seconds later. No one ever heard about what happened at the West home that day. Nelson and Jimmy stayed silent, and Peter didn't even have a clue. The only question he had was who had dug up his backyard and decided to plant a vegetable garden. The dolls know, of course. They still move from time to time, taking care of things when they need to be taken care of. Peter has a sense of it happening, but he tries not to pay too much attention. Some things in life, it's just easier to get past them. It's just easier to tell yourself, I'm just losing time. And you've been listening to Strange Playthings by Christopher Zaleski. A good reminder to always be respectful of women, even the rubber ones. You know, just because they have their mouth in that perpetual O shape doesn't always mean they're so accommodating. Just mind your damn manners is all I'm saying. I have it on good authority this is a true story. Hmm, think about that for a while. A little about the author. Christopher Zaleski is an author from Eastern Pennsylvania. Say, that's up there around where Jeff comes from. Well, that explain. <clears throat> anyway, Christopher lives with his wife and five kids. He's written two novels available on Amazon and Audible. Dead Case, his latest, is a dark crime thriller about a clairvoyant cop who gleans wisdom from the ghosts of murdered victims. On a hunt for a vigilante killer, with his life and his family hanging in the balance, Detective Wayne Ballard is forced to confront a darker side of himself, and there's a whole lot more there than he ever imagined. For over 12 hours of suspense and psychological horror, pick up Dead Case on Audible.com. And while you're at it, do something for me, would you? Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a five-star review and a kind word. Every one of these makes a big difference and I'd really appreciate it, even if you're listening on YouTube. And as I said before, we are accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, then send them to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram. Stop on by and say hi. I won't bite. Much. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least until next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend, and maybe even a piece of this magical gum while you're at it. I tell you, smoking is the last thing on my mind. In fact, I can personally guarantee you'll never see me smoking again. By next week, you won't even recognize me. My voice will sound just like Wayne Newton. So until then, may the wind be at your back. May the road rise up to meet you. And in the words of my dear grandma, never bring a knife to a gunfight. Or a gun to a sex doll fight. Not saying I expect you to get in many of those, but, you know, I'm just looking out for you. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Chester, come here, Chester. Daddy needs some new boots. <laughs> Chilling tales for dark.
dark nights.